Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Caitlin Edwards, and I am the Community Events Manager here at L uh, Linux Professional Institute. Thank you for joining us today at our first DevOps Tools Engineer Preparation Webinar. A little background on Linux Professional Institute. We are a global certification standard and career support organization for open source professionals with more than 165,000 certification holders. It's the world's first and largest vendor neutral Linux and open source certification body. LPI has certified professionals in over 180 countries, delivers exams in multiple languages and has hundreds of training partners. During the webinar, uh, please feel free to write questions you have in the chat box at the bottom of the screen there. Um, we'll also be using the hand, raise your hand indicator as well for a few questions. I'll keep track and we'll facilitate some Q&A throughout the webinar. And we want to make this webinar as interactive as possible. So just to start a little bit. Um, in a few words, uh, if you could use the chat box, I'm, I'm hoping you could write down what you're uh, hoping to get out of today's webinar. The webinar recording and slides will be shared with you after the webinar as well. Uh, today's webinar will be led by one of our certified trainers, Alexi Selkin from Vertical Sysadmin. A little bit about Vertical Sysadmin. It's founded in 2009. It's a premier IT company helping both IT novices and experts alike to achieve real learning. Adhering to the idea that studying and learning should be approached with the same precision as software development, VSA's instructors and training program designers are able to provide training starting from students' level of understanding and walk them up through the learning curve, virtually eliminating the pains of grasping new concepts and building uh, greater understanding. Our presenter, um, Alexi, has been a Unix Linux administrator for 20 years and he now server automate automation consultant Lexi why don't you take it away thank you Kason welcome everybody so I want to start with the definition of DevOps make sure that we're all on the same page so there's this different definitions of uh, DevOps about different um, attempts it's, it's kind of a, a little amorphous in a way so I'm just Going with Wikipedia, DevOps is a set of software development practices that combine software development, that's the dev part of DevOps, and information technology operations, ops, to shorten the system's development life cycle. So that means from idea through implementation, development testing, deployment, production, maintenance, ongoing support, Right, and finally, retiring the system in, in a clean way. All while de delivering features, fixes, and updates frequently in close alignment with business objectives. So DevOps came about as a way to break down the, the barrier between Dev and Ops, get them working more closely together, better aligned, and delivering more business value faster. So now I would like to do a poll question. How many of you are already involved with DevOps work? How many of you are doing DevOps work now? Please answer using the poll feature at the, at the bottom. Looks like we have uh, three to five people here. Okay, good. So most of the attendees are looking to get into DevOps, so would like to learn more about it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, so first I'll just uh, um, quickly go through these uh, first few points about LPI and the exam program. And then we'll spend the bulk of our time on the last bullet point, which is the DevOps exam objectives and how to prepare for the exam. But I don't want to go too fast because I want to make sure you know what you're getting into, you know what to expect when it comes to the exam so you're successful. So if anyone has any questions, I encourage please 
uh, put them in chat and uh, Caitlin will, will stop me and will answer your questions. So the obligatory disclaimer, anything I say about the exam preparation, exam strategy, et cetera, those are my opinions. I, I did, as Caitlin mentioned, I am certified, so I took the exam myself, so I'm, I'm well familiar with it. The important thing is the exam tests your knowledge, so it doesn't matter how you got the knowledge. There's different ways to prepare. You can study a book, you can listen to video, you can attend a, uh, a training. Somebody can show you. It doesn't matter how you learned it. LPI just tests how, whether, whether you know or not. So th there's no uh, training that LPI sells and benefits from that. So use your own judgment. I do, however, hope to give you some useful resources. All right, so LPI is a nonprofit organization. It's based in Canada, but it's active worldwide. There's regional partners worldwide, and it's independent. It's vendor neutral. So, for example, the LPI system administration exams have questions involving Red Hat flavors of Linux and also the Debian or Ubuntu-based versions of Linux. And the mission of LPI is to promote the use of open source by elevating the people who work with it. So it was founded when, uh, in the 90s. And it's grown considerably since. As you can see, there's hundreds of thousands of certified professionals, hundreds of thousands of exams given huge presence and huge impact as well. All right, so an LPI certification affirms that a certain minimum level of competence, it affirms that you're engaged in continuing education because these uh, certifications, they, they have a certain time after which they're no longer active. So if you maintain your certification, it, it demonstrates your commitment to ongoing education, and it, it's a well-known and well-respected credential. So it's well-recognized, many ways to prepare for it. I'm going a little faster because I want to have time for the technical content. All right, so LPI started with, with uh, these LPIC uh, certifications. Um, Linux uh, Professional Institute certified uh, Linux administrator, that's level one, Linux engineer, that's level two. So in the 1990s, when Linux was, was just growing and just starting to enter the data center, there was concern about, well, uh, who are we going to have uh, run these systems? How do we know if the person really knows it? And so to, to forward open source and to forward the use of Linux, Linux Professional Institute created in collaboration and in consultation with community created these tests, these exams, and later they were extended, extended, added the LPIC-3, the, the advanced levels, the enterprise levels. It was extended downwards as well, Linux Essentials, coverage of the basics, the fundamentals. And most recently, at the end of uh, 2017, the DevOps Tools Engineer examination. Now, as you can see here from this roadmap, LPIC-1 is recommended for the DevOps exam. It's not required, but it is recommended. And practically speaking, when you're doing DevOps work, it really helps if you have that foundational knowledge of system administration. Linux Essentials is entry level. It's, it's good maybe for young people or people changing changing fields, right? If you're already working in IT, most likely you don't need this, and this is not required. All right, so DevOps tools engineer exam. Just the tools and tech. Well, there is a bit of a uh, philosophy um, aspect to DevOps. There's uh, 
um, organizational aspects to it, right? This is this uh, philosophy of reducing waste that comes from Lean. That's a very important part of DevOps. Uh, and that is not covered in the exam, right? What's covered in the exam is the tooling, the automation, right? The things that help us uh, measure and, and know how well we're doing. And the exam number is 701. That's important when you're registering. Make sure you register for the right exam since there's multiple exams. Okay, LPIC 1 is the, the first level of system administration. There's actually two exams. To maintain an LPIC 1 certification, there's two exams, 101 and 102. You have to pass them both. All right, then there's LPIC 2. And you do have to have an active LPIC 1 certificate to take LPIC 2. Okay, I'll skip LPIC 3. Now let's talk about pre pre preparing for the exam. Okay, so the exam format for the DevOps exam is you'll have 90 minutes to get through 60 questions. The questions are of different types and make sure you don't confuse them. Okay, so make sure you recognize the type of question. It could be multiple choice or fill in the blank. If it's multiple choice, you could have four or five answers and you have to choose one or you have to choose another number. So read the question carefully, it will tell you. It will say pick one correct answer or it will say pick two correct answers. So you don't want to mistakenly answer just one when you see a correct answer when actually the, the question is asking you for two. Fill in the blank, fill in the blank is free text. So this could be the name of a command, it could be the name of a parameter, could be a configuration option, could be a path, a file name, etc. So read the question carefully, it will tell you what it's asking for. Only one correct response is required. All right, now, um, why do you think LPI does that? Why do you think it mixes the multiple choice questions with uh, fill in the blank? Please put your answer in the chat. Alexi, can you please repeat the question? Yes, the question was, why do you suppose when LPI develops the, the exam, why do they give these different types of questions? In other words, why not just make it all multiple choice? That would certainly be easier to grade. Why do we ask you to fill in the blank? Why do you suppose that might be? We have a Please couple. Please put your answer in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. We have a couple answers here. Um, that is, uh, a lot of them are saying that's a good question and that they would really like the answer for that. Um, preventing brain dumps. Um, and because multiple choices can possibly re be replied by luck. That's right. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. A lot of work has gone into preparing these exams. Uh, make sure they're fair um, and also make sure that, they, that they're good. they give a good evaluation of the person's knowledge. So you could just get lucky with a multiple choice, but fill in the blank. You have to know it. There's no way around it. So professional psychometricians were consulting, consulted and constructing these exams as well as industry experts. Um, as well as, uh, you know, exam development is open to the community. You can join the LPI exam dev mailing list and you can provide input because LPI does refresh these exams every few years. Um, for example, the exams with the five-year active lifespan for the certificate, um, three years in, uh, the new one comes out because the technology keeps changing. So, all right, very good. We'll continue. Is it very carefully crafted? All right, so what it comes down to in the end is um, 
it's it's pass or fail, right? Um, you do get a score. Scores range from 200 to 800. So you, you have to get above 500 in order to pass. You're not penalized for answering wrong. You get a certain amount of points for answering correctly, and how many points uh, varies. Um, and also the, the, the different um, areas are weighed, so some of them will have more questions than others. So each item has its own difficulty, and the number of points varies based on that. So what does this mean? Uh, first of all, it means you don't have to know everything. Don't be daunted, because there's a lot to learn. But you do have to know a fair amount. The idea being, once you have a certain minimum base amount of knowledge, you can pick up the rest as you go. You can already be productive in, in professionally productive in the area. All right, so every exam has published exam objectives that were developed in consultation with community and with industry experts and with, with LPI's own staff. The objectives will give examples of commands, files, and terms. But keep in mind, this is a partial list only. This is not an exhaustive list. And so if you want to get more involved, if you want to see them, there's, there's the link. You can just get to it from lpi.org or go to wiki.lpi.org. So I will show you some, some examples. But before I do, I'll just mention where you can take an LPI exam. LPI travels to different conferences, so they might come to a conference near you. Or you can go to a local Pearson View test center and take the exam there, and you'll get your results immediately. That's what I did when I took my exam. Although originally, when I first uh, got acquainted with LPI, it was at Ohio Linux Fest, and I took a, a paper-based exam. All right, so be well prepared for your exam day. Make sure you've slept well, have appropriate levels of sugar and caffeine in your system. Don't be sick, All right? Make sure you're not under the influence of medicine or whatever. Uh, if you need special arrangements, secure that in advance. Basically, make sure that you don't have any distractions. You're not going to have your phone in there. It'll be just, just you and the test. Make sure you're ready to go in because once you leave, the exam is over. So you go in, you take the test, you're done. Bring your photo ID with you, your LPI ID number, which if you don't have one, you can get for free on the website. During the exam, read the questions carefully. There are no trick questions, but, but you do have to know to succeed. All right, there's different, different ways to approach it. One possible strategy is first pass to answer everything you can quickly, don't get hung up on anything. Second pass to focus on the rest, and then do a control pass to, to verify. That's the kind of the official recommendation. Um, it seems like a pretty practical approach, but again, do what works best for you. You're encouraged to answer every question. If you're not sure, still go ahead and answer it. You're not penalized for incorrect answers. Alexi, I have a quick question here for you. Mm -hmm. um, how many attempts can one make for an exam? And what's the time? Oh, that's period? a great question. Okay, good. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to okay, that. That's perfect. actually coming up. Let me check. I think it's uh, nearly the next uh, slide. Okay. So yeah, it, um, that's not it. Four weeks for paper exams. You get a certificate. Let me just, aha. Uh -huh. Nope. Let me just get to that slide. There we go. Okay, so if you didn't pass, First of all, you will get a score. It's not, uh, you'll, you'll get for each knowledge area that's covered in the exam objectives, you'll get an overall score for that knowledge area. So that, that um, tells you what you need to study up on. You can try again after one week. So there's a bit of a cooling off period, it gives you time to brush up on your weak areas. 
If you fail again, then there is another cooling off period, which is 90 days. So you have more time to study, more time to practice, and you're welcome to try again. All right. Now let me just uh, talk a little bit about the active aspect of the cert. So after five years, the certification becomes inactive. So you're still certified, but the cert is no longer active, which means you can no longer use it as a base for higher certification. Right now, there is no higher certification for the DevOps uh, um, path, so that's not an issue. That's more an issue for LPIC 1 and LPIC 2. But in any case, LPI recommends recertifying every two and a half to three years to make sure you stay current. So, for example, the LPI DevOps exam objectives, they were published a year and a half ago, and looking at them now, I can already see um, how the technology landscape is changing, and I can see and can see that it's good that the LPI has a refresh cycle on these things. All right, we'll continue. All right, now let's get into the sample questions. Okay, these are sample questions from the DevOps uh, DevOps exam guide. Okay, so this is a multiple choice question with one correct answer. And I'll just let you read that. Let me know when you're done. Let me know in the chat when you're done. I think we can move forward now. Okay, good. All right, here's a multiple choice question with multiple correct answers. Which of the following Git sub commands can be used to boot a new file existing in a Git repository under version control? Choose two correct answers. So there's more than one way to do that. So pick out the, the two answers that are correct. Okay, here's a fill in the blank question asking for a file name. By default, which file in a build context is read by Docker build to get the information about the steps required to create a new container image? Specify the file name only without any path. Now, why do you suppose it says file name only without any path? Why without any path? Put your answer in chat. Why don't we ask for a path? We have an answer path, uh, file path differs based on platform. Exactly, thank you very much. File path differs based on platform, good. Here's an example of a fill in the blank question asking for a command. Which command included in Kubernetes is the main tool that is used to deploy and manage applications on the Kubernetes cluster? And again, specify only the command without any path or parameters. All right, so answers to the above sample questions are on page eight of the LPI DevOps exam guide, which is linked to from lpi.org slash DevOps. By the way, that's DevOps central as far as LPI DevOps examination is concerned, tons of information, links, et cetera, on that site. This is great, Alexi, because we've had a number of questions and I knew we were gonna come to this, but we have had a number of questions that people really enjoy learning um, 
from books. So any recommendations uh, throughout the webinar would be greatly appreciated. Okay, good. So uh, books, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, the, DevOps, the DevOps handbook um, is uh, the DevOps text um, uh, today um, that covers the tools and philosophy, really the whole kind of culture um, of DevOps, that business impact, that, that's a very good one. Um, as far as the actual um, uh, books on tools, uh, there's a number of them out there. Um, and um, I think as, as, we, as we go into the knowledge areas, you'll see what, what the different technologies are. But I'll mention another one, um, which is Forget. Uh, ProGit is available for free online, and it's linked to from, from the Git project. So that's also a very good one for learning Git. All right, so now I'm going to go into what's actually on the exam objectives. So first, high level, software engineering. That includes modern software development, standard components, and platforms for software. Now, what does that mean? Can anyone give an example of a standard component or platform for software? Uh, we have operating system. Operating system, that's right. You've got to run your application on somewhere. Um, database, um, that's a standard component, um, a library. Good. Source code management, as well as continuous integration and continuous delivery. And examples of tools are Git and Jenkins. Container management. That includes container usage, container deployment, container orchestration, and container infrastructure. Tools covered include Docker, Docker Swarm, and Kubernetes. Machine deployment. So that covers virtual machine deployment, cloud deployment, and system image creation. Tools include Vagrant, CloudInit, and Packer. And I, I find this initial overview helpful. If you're just getting started, you want to make sure you understand all the terms. Right? If there's something you're not familiar with, you can look it up. There's, there's tons of resources online. And um, I will give you some additional resources as well as we continue through the presentation. Configuration management. Ansible plays a very big part there other configuration management tools as well, such as Chef and Puppet. Service operations. Operations, monitoring, log management, and analysis. Examples of tools include Prometheus, LogStash, and ElkStack. All right, we'll continue. All right, so the very best study guide for the DevOps exam is a 14-post blog series by Fabian Thorns called DevOps Tools Introduction. And if you go to lpi.org slash DevOps, you'll see a big link, big fat link to DevOps Tools Introduction. And he has links to resources to excellent high quality resources. So that's what I would recommend. That's what I used as my roadmap. And I, I took the exam as soon as it came out, pretty soon after it came out. So Fabian was still writing the, the series at the time. I think he was on his ninth post or 10th post. And so I didn't even have the benefit of having the full study guide, but uh, I did use, use the blog post series quite heavily and I didn't get like the top, top score, but um, there's a joke. What do you call the guy who graduates last, um, you know, with, with the, the lowest uh, score um, 
from medical school? And the answer is doctor. So again, it's pass or fail. Uh, I knew enough to, to pass and I know enough to, uh, to get my job done and I'm always learning more. All right, so now I'm going to go in, in detail uh, into the exam objectives. All right, and the exam objectives are published online. Take your own time to study them. Uh, as you start reading Fabian's uh, blog post uh, series, um, you will see he recommends even going as far as printing it out and having different color highlighters and so on and, and really, really getting familiar with it. Any questions on anything I've covered so far? You've answered a lot of them that have come in, which is great. Um, but yes, of course, if, if anyone has uh, questions, the chat room is the best, uh, the best place to put them there. Okay, thank you, Kate. All right, so again, when you're uh, registering for the exam, make sure you register for the right exam. It's exam 701, the exam code is 701-100. There's only one 701 exam, and we're at version 1.0. And if you're interested in uh, contributing um, to the revision of the exam objectives, get involved. LPI exam dev is the name of the mailing list. All right, so there's going to be multiple objectives. Each objective has a weight, the relative importance. So if the weight is higher, that means there's going to be more questions. So on the right are the main topic areas. I already went through them, software engineering, container management, machine deployment, that's VM deployment, right? So you have, you have containers and you have VMs. Um, you have uh, configuration management and you have operations. So in other words, this is your, your software development life cycle. You, you build it, right? You deploy it, you operate it. All right, so each of those knowledge areas breaks down into sub knowledge areas. So for example, software engineering breaks down into modern software development, standard components and platforms, source code management, continuous integration and continuous delivery. Of those, you can see that modern software development has a higher weight, standard components and platforms has a lower weight. So if you're pressed for time, you can zero in on the areas with a higher weight. Or if you just want to learn the whole thing, you want to learn the lay of the land and be fully professional, right? This gives you a roadmap coupled with uh, Fabian's blog post that has links to learning resources. Uh, you can you can pick up quite a lot quickly and and have a very broad uh, knowledge base, which comes in helpful when it comes time to to handle things, to troubleshoot issues. It, it's really helpful to have that broad broad knowledge base. So one thing you might notice just quickly scanning down the weights as one area in particular stands out. That's Ansible. Ansible has the highest weight. Uh, second highest weight is container usage. Right, so launching containers with Docker and configuring the VMs that those containers will run on with Ansible. Those are things you should start on. All right, so now I'm going to um, look uh, with you at the, the software engineering exam objectives. All right, we'll just zero in on that. So modern software development, you should be able to design software solutions suitable for modern runtime environments. What does that mean? What do we mean by modern runtime environments? Please put your answer in chat. Can you repeat the question one more time? Yes. Uh, what are some examples of modern runtime environments? A runtime environment is where your application is running. So 
So what, what is that likely to be today? Any guesses from anyone? Put your runtime, answer in chat. Runtime environments that are not outdated. So they are basically uh, industry standard now. That's right, that's right. And the industry is moving towards cloud. So cloud-based, cloud-native, um, as opposed to your own on-premises data center, your own data closet, depending how, how big your organization is, right? So now it's all about abstracting the hardware, serverless, and all of that. All right. So this means uh, services. So you should, you should understand how services handle data persistence, sessions, status information, transactions, concurrency, and so on and so forth. I won't read the whole slide, but um, you should also understand what is agile, and how Agile relates to DevOps. So there's, overall, there's far too much information for me to, uh, um, I won't try to teach you all of this in the course of this webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to prepare you for the exam, um, re really to prepare you for preparing for the exam so that you know what is on the exam, so you know what to study, and so that you know what, what to expect. So there's no surprises like, oh, I didn't know this would be on the test. Okay, so now let's look at modern software development in more detail. What does it cover, right? So it covers service-based applications. So you have REST API. You have JSON for, for data transfer, right? Um, data storage. What does it mean to design software to run in containers? Why do we want to do that? What are the advantages of that? Right? Why use the cloud? What is the cloud? What are the risks um, involved in uh, migrating monolithic legacy software to modern uh, services-based software? Right? And then what are some common application security risks and ways to mitigate them? So there's an overlap here with uh, InfoSec. Right? What is Agile? What is DevOps? And here's a partial list of the use files, terms, and utilities. Don't get discouraged. I know that there's a lot here, but, but this, is, this is a key part of modern IT. So it's, it's worth the time to study up on it, to understand it. And Fabian's blog post series has links to learn about all of these. All right, so now we're still in uh, modern software development. We're just on to the next subtopic, which is standard components and platforms for software. All right, so you should understand services offered by common cloud platforms. All right, so like AWS EC2, Elastic Compute Cloud, all right, um, storage. And you should be able to Include these services in your application architecture and deployment tool chains, and you should be able to configure them, right? You should be able to configure the, the virtual network segments in your cloud infrastructure. And OpenStack open service components are used as a reference implementation. I will have some examples of that shortly. So the key knowledge areas here are object storage, Databases, both SQL and NoSQL. Messaging, so message brokers, message queues. Big data services. Application runtimes, platform as a service. And CDN, content delivery networks. So here's some examples of, of technologies. OpenStack, Swift, which is a cloud object storage service. Trove which is database as a service, Zocar, which is messaging, Cloud Foundry, that's an open source application platform as a service, Suite, 
and OpenShift, which is Red Hat's highly opinionated platform as a service implementation. And don't get discouraged if, 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 if like there's, I know there's a lot on this list, but if you know one of these, the concepts translate quite easily to the others. So don't, in other words, don't think you have to learn it all. Don't despair. Okay, so source code management is the next subtopic. You should be able to use Git to handle source code, to collaborate on source code. And that's where I mentioned the pro Git book is, is a very good one, right? You should be able to merge files and you should know how to resolve merge conflicts that does come up. All right, now, in addition to being able to handle Git, you should be aware of what came before Git, subversion, CVS, you should understand what are the differences between centralized and distributed source code management. You will find a lot of organizations are still using those older technologies. They're still using subversion, still using CVS, and you can help them out. You can help them, if appropriate, um, migrate to to modern tool like Git, which lets you do things that you can't do with those older tools. Alexi, sorry to interrupt. I have a question here. Um, Great, I love questions. Can you suggest any online platform where we can exercise on OpenStack? I don't. This particular person doesn't have an OpenStack installation at work, and they're not sure if they can fit it on their laptop. Wow. Yeah, that's a great question. No, I'm not aware of uh, um, of that. Um, I think you have to bring one up. Um, I would think that you can uh, do that. Um, you should be able to do that in the cloud. You should be able to do that in the cloud. So um, I might take that as a uh, as a follow up question if you want to. Um, Email me. Um, I can get back to you on that. But uh, um, I think that if you bring up some some VMs in the cloud, you should be able to install OpenStack. Um, if not, um, I haven't actually done that myself, right? So um, what I know will work for sure is if you have your own hardware, you have your own lab. So I understand it might not fit on your laptop. Well, you might need uh, to invest in a uh, a learning lab. You might want to invest in a server. You can pick up a, uh, you know, a used server for relatively cheap. Um, you can get a, uh, a learning platform. So actually, that that that's the answer I would go with. Is invest in uh, um, in setting up a learning lab. I remember when I was learning Linux, is uh, I got uh, a laptop, an old laptop, and installed Linux on it, and that was just like, okay, so if I break it. Fine, it's my learning environment, so I don't, I don't have to be concerned. I don't have to be careful. So that's my recommendation. Invest in creating a, a learning environment. It'll pay off in the long run, you know. Uh, DevOps pays more um, than adjacent professions like system administration. Uh, this, this recently came out of one of the DevOps days, you know, one, one day conferences, um, regional conferences. Um, they, learned, they did a salary survey, and they found that uh, just just by putting DevOps in your title, you're making twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year, US more. All right, I'll continue. A uh, couple more questions, if you don't mind. Great, I love questions. Is GitLab something like SVN? Or is GitLab something CVS? like SVN? Okay, so, okay, so uh, GitLab is uh, Git plus some bells and whistles, right? So, so Git is a distributed version control, and GitLab is a web application that gives you a web front end to Git, right? So you, you still have your projects, and you, you have them in a repository, right? But you can do things like there's a ticket system. 
issues, right? There's a wiki, and all of that is built in, smoothly integrated, the CI CD. And there's actually several solutions like that, quite a few. There's GitLab, there's GitHub, SourceHUD, uh, the, the, there's a lot. What else, Kason? That's great, and uh, thank you to all the attendees too that are answering um, in the chat. That's great because they're all uh, we're all saying the same thing here. Uh, what specs do I need to set up a lab? Okay, so just look on the project website. Once you get into the OpenStack documentation, it will tell you what the minimum requirements are in terms of CPU memory and so on. Perfect. We're good from here. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Really appreciate uh, people's participation. Okay, so here's the list of uh, technology. We'll continue. Okay, so now we're talking CICD. CICD is a very important enabling technology uh, for DevOps. All right, it is its own area, it, it predates DevOps. But, uh, okay, I won't get into it. I actually teach a whole class in CICD, so somebody's taught me. Um, so you should understand uh, what CICD is, how it works. You should be able to implement a CICD pipeline with Jenkins. And let's go on to the key knowledge areas. I'm sorry I had to use smaller fonts for this slide just because there's so many knowledge areas. Uh, but basically, you should be able to implement a CI/CD pipeline. Uh, you should be familiar with uh, Jenkins architecture. Now, Jenkins is not the only tool for CI/CD, but it is the most popular one, and uh, that's actually part of how um, exam development works. Is like, well, how do we decide what, what do we put on the exam when if there's like 20 different CI/CD tools? Right. Um, so the way that question is answered is we look at the market share, we look at the popularity. Right? We're not going to ask you to learn something obscure. So it's, it's very, very sane the way the exam objectives are uh, put together and what's on the exams. All right. And then some advanced uh, features um, such as artifacts, artifact repositories. Um, um, Alexi, someone works with Bamboo, yeah. would that be similar? Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, but the thing is, when you sit the exam, there are going to be Jenkins questions on it. So you might work with another tool and you might, I, I, I think that you would be able to learn Jenkins very quickly if you already have experience with CICD. So to, to pass the exam, you have to you have to uh, get over 500 points. You know, there's over 200. From 200 to 800, you have to score about 500. So I won't, I, I won't tell you what you have to learn because that's individual. What you should do is you should go through these knowledge areas. You should, first of all, you should go through the exam guide from the LPI website. Uh, there's a self-assessment there. Uh, you should print out the exam objectives, right, and so you can mark up and just go through it and find out what do you already know? What do you need to learn? And then what is your objective? You know, are you trying to uh, increase your qualifications um, so you can do a better job in your current uh, work? Are you trying to break into DevOps, right? Um, and then you know how much you want to study. Do you want to study just enough to pass the exam or do you want to study um, do you want to study uh, enough to be able to do, to operate in all of these different areas, right? I, I always study for uh, uh, ability for application, right? So if you have no use for Jenkins, because your company doesn't use Jenkins, don't study Jenkins. If you focus on uh, containers and uh, uh, configuration management of VMs, Ansible, you know, you understand your basics with Git, that may just be enough for you to pass the exam. All right, and then other things. I'll continue with these key knowledge areas. Yes, Kason? 
Are you we'll able something. to uh, define which Jenkins pipeline, uh, declarative or scripted, with with Groovy? Yeah, yeah, um, uh, both really. Both. Okay. Great. So um, that's a typo. That should be DSL, uh, Jenkins DSL, uh, declarative pipeline. Perfect. Um, all of that. And is there right. any so, question about um, Travis in the within? Uh, the, no, no like Travis that. CI. That's another popular tool, right? Um, well, well, actually, I shouldn't say no um, because uh, this uh, technology list is not exhaustive, right? And so, basically, what you can expect is to the extent that. Uh, um, a tool is widely used. Um, it may appear on the exam, right? I think if you if you understand the basic concepts of CI/CD and can set up CI/CD, here's what I would say: um, you should be able to set up a CI/CD pipeline using any tool. Really, you should understand the fundamentals well enough that you can set it up using any tool, because because then it's it's. Uh, um, it's a much smaller step to learn a, a second or third CI/CD tool compared to just getting the basic concepts down. There's a lot of questions. There's a whole question bank, right, uh, from which questions are drawn when you actually come to set the test. So when you come to retake the test, if you come to retake the test, don't be surprised if you get different questions, all right? So whether questions about Travis will be on the exam, it's not explicitly listed in the exam objectives. But understanding CICD is. So I hope that answered your question. Thanks, Alexi. Okay, wonderful. All right, so now we'll continue. Now we're getting into container management. So container management, this, this is the uh, second, uh, container usage is the second highest weight after Ansible, right? So you should be able to build a Docker container image, right? You should be able to share it with others and you should be able to operate Docker containers. You should be able to launch them, run them, get them to be able to talk to each other, right? So you should be able to create Docker files. You should be able to use a Docker registry, right? And you should be able to uh, handle the container infrastructure, such as networks and storage volumes. All right, now I've covered all of this. All right, and there's a link from uh, Fabian's blog post series to uh, container training and online uh, self-paced training, uh, really high quality material. Um, I credit passing the LPI exam to just making friends with that training and spending lots of time and going through it and following along all the examples, every single one, bringing up the containers, bringing up the networks, attaching storage, removing storage, all of this stuff. It was well worth the time. All right, so the next subtopic is container deployment and orchestration, All right? So now we're talking about multiple containers, container orchestration, and this covers Docker Compose, Docker Swarm, All right? So you should be able to bring up a service that requires, let's say, five containers and Kubernetes. And Kubernetes has only gotten bigger since the exam objectives were issued, more popular, very, very active area for development. So you should be able to, you should understand uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, fundamentals, such as definitions of a deployment, a service, a replica set, and a pod. All right, there's your partial list of technologies. And, and by the way, that, that last one, that's pronounced kubectl. 
Very cute pronunciation, cube cuddle. All right, container infrastructure. So what does that mean? That means where are you running these containers? And there's a lot of options today for running containers. Docker is a hugely, hugely popular one. So again, time spent learning Docker is time well spent. CoreOS Container Linux, there's some alternatives to Docker. And you should understand the security risks of uh, container virtualization and how to mitigate them. All right, machine deployment. And by machine deployment today, we mean virtual machine. All right, this is modern, All right? So you should be able to automate the deployment of a virtual machine with an operating system and a specific set of configuration files and software. So in other words, you spin up the VM and you configure it. All right, so you've got Vagrant. the different provisioners for Vagrant, such as File, Shell, Ansible, and Docker. And you should understand multi-machine setup, like how do you spin up five VMs at once, and how do you make it so that they can talk to each other, all right? Vagrant file syntax. And this is something you should definitely definitely get some hands-on experience with. Cloud deployment. How do you bring up instances in the cloud? How do you configure them? And how do you integrate them with configuration management? So this is where cloud init comes in to, to set up the systems upon provisioning. How do you put how do you inject user data into your brand new instance? And then there's uh, infrastructure level concerns such as snapshotting, pausing these VMs, cloning these VMs, and imposing resource limits. All right, another subtopic is system image creation. So when you bring up a VM, you're booting a system image, right? So how do you create that system image? you're expected to be able to create system images. The most popular tool for that is Packer. And I just wanna say, when I say the most popular tool is Packer, this is not LPI's opinion, right? Like an actual survey was done and the exam objectives were constructed based on survey results. It's, it's what you said. <laughs> to LPI, right? That's what went into constructing the exam. And also when the exam gets refreshed, it'll be the same cycle of getting community input, community feedback. That's what I really like about LPI is they do the legwork necessary to engage with the community online. They do the travel all over the world to go to conferences, to engage with people face to face and now these webinars, I'm a big fan of LPI. Alexi, a quick All question right. here. Is Terraform yes. also a part of uh, yes. this? Okay. Yes, Terraform um, is uh, uh, important for managing infrastructure today, right? Um, Terraform is doing quite well. It's also growing and uh, getting more adoption. So. Um, at the time that the exam objectives were constructed, a year and a half ago, right, it was released, um, Terraform wasn't uh, big enough. Um, I don't remember that it's explicitly mentioned, but that, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, you shouldn't learn it, right? I'm just saying that uh, purely from a standpoint of 
what is on the exam, what do you have to know to pass the exam. Uh, Terraform isn't a, a, a big ticket item. The big ticket items are the ones that um, basically I'm going over. Um, Ansible and, uh, well, we'll get to it, Chef and Puppet. There's other config management tools, right? Like uh, somebody asked me, well, uh, I'm working with Salt, you know? Well, okay, great, but uh, most of the world is using Ansible, right? So, sorry. Um, it's wonderful you know Salt, right? And it's great you're using Terraform, right? But it's not um, a big part of the exam. I think if you know it, great. Um, if you're asking whether you should study Terraform, uh, follow the exam objectives. They outline what, what, what you should study. Um, so far, we haven't uh, seen Terraform. All right, so Ansible. Use Ansible to ensure a target server is in a specific state regarding its configuration and installed software. This is another slide where I had to reduce the font. There's a lot covered. There's a lot you can do with Ansible. If you know your basics um, of Ansible syntax, of how to run Ansible, um, that will uh, take you a long way. And then for bonus points, there's advanced usage such as uh, secrets and templating and, uh, and so on. Lots to learn here. You should definitely understand the basics of like playbook, playbook structure, roles, right? How to run a playbook. So all the configuration management tools, candidates should understand the main features and principles of important configuration management tools other than Ansible. Okay, so this is where Puppet and Chef comes in. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, you, you see, I, I don't know all the questions. I was not involved in, uh, I wasn't one of the cooks in the kitchen, you know, putting together this exam. What I am is, I'm a practitioner, right? So I have access to public information. I have access to exam objectives. I'm just revisiting the Terraform question here, right? And so um, I don't know how many questions there are in total, right? And in, in the total question bank, right? So the, there may be a Terraform question in there, right? There may be a solve question in there, right? Um, but I wouldn't expect it to be heavily represented. So I would focus my study on Ansible, and then I would focus on Puppet and Chef, and then, um, and only then, um, would I add other things like, like Terraform and CS Engine or Salt and so on. So I hope that was a comprehensive answer. Okay, so here's knowledge list. A partial list, not an exhaustive list. All right, so now we're into the last knowledge area, which is service operations. All right, so you should know what's involved in terms of IT infrastructure, the goals we have um, as operators, things like being able to uh, Observe the system, being able to monitor it, being able to, to troubleshoot, right? Um, how do you uh, measure, right? Security. So here we have non-functional properties, such as availability, late latency, responsiveness. How do you measure these things? All right, and then tools. Prometheus, Grafana, right, the security aspects. Okay, so here's our technology list. This is, by the way, where you have things like uh, uh, load balancers, um, DNS load balancing versus uh, um, 
network devices that, that do load balancing, right? Security updates. How do you integrate that with everything else you're doing, right? Firewalls. All of that applies to uh, to security. Uh, different uh, different channels of attack, different types of attack, denial of service attacks, targeted attacks, etc. So this is all about. Okay, so you've developed your, your, your service, you've architected it, you've launched it, now what? How do you keep the service healthy? How do you update your infrastructure? Let's say a new version of Docker has come out, right? How do you deploy that without with zero downtime for your users? All right, so log management and analysis specifically. You should understand the role of log files in operations and in troubleshooting. And you should be able to set up a centralized logging infrastructure. And in this case, we're saying based on Logstash, that's an open source tool, right? And this is the Elk stack. You have Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. What are the different parts? What do they do? How do they fit together? All right, you should be able to create a centralized logging infrastructure. Just as earlier, I said you should be able to set up a CI CD pipeline. That's your your road to production, or that you're in production, you should have a log infrastructure. So you should understand how application logging works, how system logging works, how the two integrate, right? Um, the life cycle of a log message, how log retention, right? Understand the architecture and functionality of uh, the Elk stack. And you should be able to configure your system to integrate it with the centralized logging system. How do you set up alerting? How do you set up alerting in such a way that you don't uh, shoot yourself in the foot and you know, kill yourself with, with uh, too many alerts in the off hours? How do you alert and just what's important? How do you not miss things? Like all of these things come into play here. All right, so you need to uh, be able to construct these alerts, construct these filters, um, what things are important to get into the centralized logging system. Alexi, mm -hmm. where could someone learn um, about setting up advanced Elk stacks? Okay, good. So actually, um, um, I want to take uh, a minute here and I want to actually demonstrate the usefulness of uh, the study guide and how I would use it. I'm going to use it to answer this question. So bear with me just a minute. I'll go to that. So I'm going to lpi.org slash DevOps. All right. Scroll down a bit. And the very first big link here is the DevOps tools introduction. Let me just go full screen here. Okay, so there's the, the blog. Let me make my font size a bit larger. All right, so as you can see, there's links, links to resources. You don't necessarily have to follow every single link, but uh, it does link to key resources. So I'm going to just go through all of these to get to the last one because that's where we, we talk about 
um, logs. Just bear with me for a minute or two. We're more than halfway there. All right, so IT operations and monitoring. OK, here we go, log management and analysis. OK, so what we have here is uh, a link to the Elastic Stack, to the main page. Log stash documentation. And specifically, we call out the introduction and getting started for log stash, as well as how log stash works. So all uh, kind of basic foundational knowledge, right? Um, let's see what else we have here. OK, then we have the configure log stash guide. Okay, file bit, which collects log data and sends it to another process. Okay, getting started guide for file big, file bit, and then um, introduction to syslog, the syslog manual. Right, this is for integrating your system into the centralized logging infrastructure. Um, then you have uh, the input, output, and filter plugins. Right, so this is for, for data collection and transformation, right, with a special focus on the grok filter and email alerting, all right. Elastic search, getting started guide, and then more advanced topics like indexes and retiring data. And finally, Kibana, which provides a graphical way to access, aggregate, and explore the logged information, all right, so you have a link to the Kibana documentation, dashboards, right? As well as uh, links to uh, best practices for logging at scale. So did that answer your question? I, yeah, it did. And I think a lot of people are finding this really useful. So thanks for showing that. Yes, and big thanks to Fabian for compiling these resources. Uh, Fabian is uh, a staff member at LPI, and uh, um, he is um, responsible for um, certification development. And this is a wonderful resource. As you can see, uh, basically every single one of his blog posts is just full of these links. And, um, and it's not just, okay, so you need... Kibana, fine, here's a link to the Kibana main page. No, he gives you 
getting started guide, you read this chapter, read that chapter, so it, it's curated, you know? Very, very useful, wonderful resource. I can't recommend it highly enough. Okay, well, I'm not going to wrestle with my presentation because actually I, I got to the end. I got to the end of my content. So at this point, I will ask if there's any other questions. Yeah, we do have lots of time for questions. We will have some uh, an email contact as well if anyone has uh, follow up questions that they wish to ask. Well, Alexi, why don't we do a poll? Why don't we do the last poll? Oh, hold on, we have a, we may have a question here. Um, any specific mm -hmm. versions of Syslog to study? No. A syslog hasn't, uh, oh, you mean like our syslog versus? Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite uh, standard, but there is also syslog and G. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that uh, uh, the exam objectives just say syslog and Fabian links to the syslog.conf men page. Um, so I, I, I would say just start with syslog. You should know syslog. Um, there are other versions available. It doesn't hurt you to know them. Um, but uh, the exam objectives uh, specifically uh, don't specifically call it out. So um, again, it's one of those things. Like the more you know, the better. But I don't, I don't think you're expected to know. Um, okay. Um, we do have a couple questions here too. So, for example, how long does it um, does a preparation need if I'm a DevOp knob um, kind of to start and if there are any books that people need to read on specific topic areas, but I think a lot of that depends on just looking over the objectives as you have said throughout your the webinar. Yeah, go through the objectives. Go through the objectives. Really take the time to, to get familiar um, with, with the objectives um, so you know what's covered. Um, go through the blog post series. And um, um, as far as how much time you need, there's a lot of ground that's covered, really a lot of ground. So um, I would give yourself adequate time. You know, it, it, it depends. People learn at, different, uh, at a different speed, right? So just give yourself enough time and make sure you give yourself enough hands-on experience because you, you'll learn better. Right, actually play around with this stuff and set up your own infrastructure and set up your own centralized logging and set up a CI CD pipeline, right? Really get to know this stuff and get, get to know it. You'll see how it works, you'll see how it breaks, you'll see how to work with it. Just get comfortable with it, get familiar with it. It'll serve you in good stead, not only for the exam, but, but professionally. And based on your experience, do you recommend doing the LPIC one first? Oh, that's a good question. Um, for somebody who is entering the profession, I would say yes. I would say yes because when this stuff breaks, when it doesn't you know, work straight out of the box, um, when things go off the rails, uh, when you have that system administration skill set, you're not lost. You can sort it out. It makes you much more valuable uh, when, you're, when you're there with, with, with others who just know, they just learned this, you know, latest and greatest hot uh, DevOps tool, but they don't have the foundational knowledge. Um, they'll be adrift, right? And you'll be able to get things going again. So I do recommend investing in, but I'm biased. I'm a system, I have a background in system administration. So I'm used to being able to uh, come in and uh, people just like, I got this error message, I don't know what to do, right? And I can get things going again. And 
I just love being able to unblock things like that. So I think, I think that's a very effective, very workable approach. And uh, that's what LPI recommends as well in terms of uh, it, it, it's recommended as the before you go to DevOps tools engineer. So you don't have to have it, but yes, I personally do recommend it. That's great. Uh, well, those are the questions that we have. Um, I'm going to put up that last poll at the moment. Um, more or less the results of, uh, oh, you can keep your, um, you can keep your screen up there, Alexi. Okay. And I can add, uh, I can add this poll to the screen. Great. So please let me know. Uh, there we go. So please vote there. So as of today's uh, webinar, how confident are you now on how to prepare for the LPI exam? Like we, I know that we have definitely gone over a lot of material and there is a lot of material to know, which um, could be a little daunting for people, but um, I think Alexi has given some resources. Yes, please answer the poll. I'd love to know. I'd love okay. to know where you stand now. Give a couple and more. Thank you very uh, much for attending. Yeah. A couple more uh, seconds here. So we're going to end polling. <clears throat> I'll share some results here. So majority of people are, uh, are fairly confident, which is really good. Um, I think, again, it's just a lot of material that uh, people find a little daunting as well and just how to get started. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> for, those um, who, for those who are uncertain, for those who are still uncertain, um, I, I recommend that uh, you take the time to go over the uh, exam objectives and just circle the ones that uh, you don't even know what it is, right? Identify the ones you need to learn more about and uh, um, then look at the Fabian series because he, he covers all the exam objectives and he gives links to all the resources. So in other words, first identify the gaps in your knowledge and then you'll get resources to, to fill those gaps. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Alexi. Uh, thank you for donating your time. This has been uh, a lot of great information. Um, if people have a few more minutes, um, I would like to invite uh, Sean Denning, the Vice President in Business Administration and Development from Vertical Sysadmin, just to say a few words here. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for coming. Um, it, it, we've had people here from uh, various places in the world, including Germany, Italy, Southern California, Ethiopia, Canada, so on. Um, and uh, it's been uh, a pleasure to uh, provide this information. We're definitely interested in your feedback. In terms of vertical sys admin and our uh, contribution and interest in uh, LPI and in assisting people who want to not only prepare themselves for an exam certification, but to launch successful careers where they feel stable and confident. We are known for our premium training um, and our ability to, uh, as Caitlin mentioned in the beginning, our ability to walk students from any level of understanding up the learning curve. So if you have any questions after this, uh, specifically regarding this webinar, anything further, uh, or anything, any kind of training needs for you or potentially any of your teams, you're very welcome to uh, reach out to us. Um, Caitlin will be providing contact information and so forth in the follow-up email that she mentioned earlier on. So thank you again, and we look forward to uh, being in touch further and providing additional trainings. Thanks, Sean. Um, that's all the time we have for today, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as, uh, as Sean mentioned, I will be sending around um, a follow-up email just with a very brief evaluation, the presentation slides, and the recording as well, so, uh, so you can get all of that stuff. And, of course, some contact information for Vertical Sysadmin. If, uh, if you do feel that some additional training would be helpful, they are, they're very great. Um, so thank you all, and have a wonderful rest of your day, and we hope to see you at the next one. Cheers all.